if I feel like there's a lack of love in my relationship, and don't get me wrong, relationships do come to an end. This isn't about something going on forever. But if I feel like like my partner's not bringing me, like my partner's not being fun or playful and I'm getting angry because of that, then it's my responsibility to look to myself and say, am I bringing play? Am I bringing the thing that I want, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's challenging because that means we come up against all of our own childhood woundings of what we didn't get that we needed. Welcome to the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. My name is Lee Davey. I'm not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am someone that doesn't drink alcohol and I spend every waking moment of my life helping other people do the same. Like right now. Let's see if I can do this very, very quickly. Okay, so here are the options available to you people. If you want to, drum roll, join the 1000 Days Sober community. So go over to Instagram, check us out there. YouTube, the same, 1000 Days Sober. That's all you need to type into Google. Uh, we have a private Facebook page. In Email us at 1kdaysober at gmail.com. And Richie will give you the link to get you into that wonderful group, okay? If you want to experience a Strive Method for Addictions and Strive Method for Workshop, a six-month coup de grace, then you can get over to the website and book a Choose Yourself call with us. We have options for group coaching. We have options for personal coaching. Remember, we have over 15 different coaches that can help you become people that don't drink alcohol. If six months is a little bit too much and you're not quite sure, You can take just our stuck phase, work with us for a month to see how much you really like the Strive Method for addictions, okay? And if you want to do that, email us at 1kdayssober at gmail.com and we will make that happen for you, either the stuck phase for addictions or the stuck phase for relationships, okay? Last but not least, if you want to take one of our workshops, our one to two hour workshops, go to the website 1000daysober.com and register your interest there to join our workshop. Now, without further ado, I am going to leave you in the capable hands of Scott Nelson. So, while growing up, it might have been a challenge for you to express yourself and hold space for difficult emotions. But now as an adult, communicating your needs to your loved ones requires a little more effort and a lot of self-compassion. This is precisely something Scott Victor Nelson relates to very well. Today, he shares why doing the work for yourself and cultivating space for self-consciousness is vital for the health of any relationship. In this episode, Scott shares the insights that he has learned in his journey towards bettering himself. He discusses this, how communication discusses this? He discusses how communication and compassion go hand in hand when dealing with conflict in relationships. Scott also shares the tools he's learned over time that has ultimately helped him identify what wounds he's been nursing and how he can heal from them. So tune in, you are to be inspired by Scott Victor Nelson's worthwhile insights gained from his journey of sobriety. Things that me and Scott get into, monogamy, commitment, love, communication, defining the difference between love and hate, asking questions, the power behind that, the ability to pause, individual responsibility, clear communication, and most importantly, cultivating a deeper relationship within ourselves. So without further ado, I'll shut the hell up leave you in the capable hands of the beautiful, the adorable, the amazing Scott Victor Nelson. And if you want to learn more about this fella and work with him, and I really tell you, go do that, go to 1000daysober.com, check out the podcast page, and you will find all these links. Take care, everybody. Scott Victor Nelson, (laughs) the man of the incredible, you can grow an incredible beard, by the way. Thanks, Lee. I appreciate that, man. You know, there's an aspect of this outside in kind of personality that I'm trying to destroy and kill. Um, And a part of that is like a comparison thing. So I always used to get envious of people with like, you could grow great bodily hair. I think it's because I, I was, a, I was the last kid in school to have pubes. So like, I always had this kind of like thing about hair being like really masculine. Sure. And then, and then me being in this stuck in this hero boy energy. So, well, you know. just so you know, I could absolutely relate because I started school a year earlier than everyone, right? Uh-huh. So, all the boys had pubes in the locker room before I did too. And I couldn't grow sideburns until I was 21. This oh. is the whole hair thing came in later in life. It came late. Yeah. yeah. I, I have a little hole in my sideburns for some reason. 
Um, but now I can grow hair a bit better than when I was younger, but I accidentally shaved my mustache off the other day. See, but you can, I can see from your face already, you can grow a good mustache. I can't. Right. If I can grow a nice big, like Appalachian beard. I, the mustache, if I try to shave it, I'll send you a picture, dude. I'll just send you when I just kept the mustache for a little while. It's someone's creepy uncle. It's, it's. I gotta see it. I gotta yeah, see it. Yeah. I gotta see it. Well, I am growing my hair. I haven't cut it since lockdown. So I've got a Legends of the Fall haircut. But enough about this vanity. We're not on here about vanity. We're here to what? save the world. Oh, we have to acknowledge the vanity to save the world, though, don't we? Because it's a you vain know. fucking world. I don't, I'm not quite sure if people hire us because of our beauty. I think they hire <laughs> us because of our, our talents. I'm not quite fucking sure. Um, I think so the beauty goes with it, my friend, whether it's external or internal. There's definitely something in the beauty that they see. That's an interesting point. I wonder if my fear of men is just a story to allow me to work with more beautiful women. Wow. That's a big question you just postulated. Hmm. Maybe. I'll have to think about that one. Wow. I like how your mind works, Lee. I like the questions you're willing to ask yourself and the, the, the deep dive you're willing to do into that exploration. I think that's really cool. Yeah, I try, to, um, I try to get our Stride community to do the same thing mm. um, because I, I actually, like, I get so much out of it. Mm -hmm. and um you know personally mm -hmm. in terms of this journey of um being rather than doing and mm -hmm. like understanding who i am and how i operate like these questions are really important you know so like that one for example let's say like i'm married to liza been with her for uh well married for like seven eight years maybe a little bit longer before that I was married to someone else for like 15 years. Oh, wow. Right? So, so like when you commit to this kind of like monogamy, this, 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 um, ideal that society wants you to fit into and you're a bloke. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so, you know, I don't know about you, but like, I just kind of like want to have sex like a lot. And if I could have sex with like loads of different people, at the same time, I probably would. Yeah. Uh, but I can't do that because of this, this self-imposed rule of monogamy, which I kind of like, you know, I've, I said I would do this kind of thing. So I wonder how once you commit to that relationship, so I, I commit to be monogamous to Liza for the rest of my life. Once you commit to that, how does that bleed out in other areas of your life? Like how does that bleed out into your use of pornography? How does that bleed out into how you use social media? How does that um, uh, bleed out into your choice of coaches? How does that bleed out into, I don't know, how deep you get in conversations with women versus men? It's interesting to think about, right? It's, yeah. And you could go down, you could go down a whole rabbit hole with that, right? Because mm. the thing is, is when we commit to one thing, we're saying yes to it. And as we say yes to one thing, we're saying no to something else. And in my experience, so I have kind of an interesting experience. Like prior to getting sober, I was married to a man. So I have an ex-husband. And when I got sober and I started doing deeper work, I realized I really wanted uh, to be in relationship with a woman. I really wanted a feminine partner. And uh, it's been a, a whole thing of unpacking all of the things that you were just describing of what I was using to blot out my own truth and my own authenticity of what I wanted. First of all, it was hard to even recognize and own what I really wanted because of what I was told, how I lived, how other people treated me. You know, my, if you come from any kind of, and I think we all do to some extent, but if you come from any kind of traumatic, traumatic background, or you come from an experience where you had to shrink to be safe, then just owning what you actually really want and what's really true for you can be terrifying because you've, you've denied it for so long, right? So you're like, I'll just play in this corner of the sandbox and I'll just make best do with whatever's in this corner. But like, there's still three other corners of the sandbox and there's a whole playground outside of that sandbox and all that stuff. And so it's, 
it's like beginning to take those first steps of paying attention to what else is there and what else is possible, right? Mm. Um, I'm now in an amazing relationship with a woman uh, that I'm committed to and in the same way, monogamously. For now, that could change. I don't know. But Mm. for now, and I find it to be such a freeing thing. And I don't use... I don't use things to escape anymore, right? Like whether it be drugs, whether it be alcohol, um, I do sometimes still find myself going a little bit to porn, but it's not what it used to be in any way. Now I'm like, oh, I'm uncomfortable. I'm going to this thing. What else can I do? Uh, Mm. I can take a nap. I can listen to music. I can play the guitar. I can go even just watch TV feels safer, (laughs) less detrimental to my well being. you know? So, um, I think it's about that, that when we make that commitment, we free ourselves up to actually have a focus of what is it going to take to honor that commitment. And through the journey of sobriety, uh, it's truly one day at a time. I don't know if I can commit to her for the rest of my life. I'd like to, Hmm. but I know that I can show up today fully in this relationship and that's the day that I'm in. That's the moment I'm in. Right. My intention is to stay committed for the rest of my life, but I have no idea what that means. There's been so many things that have happened that change and challenge things. So I think it's about moving from a a consciousness, right? Not a reactivity. I might want to sleep with someone else. I might want to act out in some way. It's not about indulging that, that craving, but using it to go deeper into being here right now, right? Like for me, it's a whole cultivation of the healthy masculine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a, I have a client who, um, he's in, he's in a relationship and, and, and he wants to, he wants to have multiple partners, you know, like he wants to have multiple partners is, um, his wife doesn't want him to, but he's kind of allowing that to happen. You know, it's like, cause the consequences are, I don't have him. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, in one, in one respect is the whole kind of like, well, you know, kudos to you, you're expressing what you want in your relationship and you're getting it. But then there's the other aspect of it. Well, there's somebody else in this relationship who is really suffering, Mm -hmm. you know, and then that whole complex debate about, you know, I remember reading a Domingo who is one of his books after my divorce, um, and really getting upset, realizing that my wife asking me for a divorce and the heartbreak that that caused and the, the level of judgmentalism, accusation, gossiping that I did around that whole thing to people to blame her. Look at me, I'm the good guy. She got rid of me. And then Don Miguel Ruiz got me to see that I was miserable in that relationship, but I stayed in it. And that was the ultimate act of disrespect to yourself, like the most and to to myself and to her. Right. So like I should have respected her by saying, go and find someone who can love you. I will not lock you into this relationship due to the fear of sunk cost, X, X, Y, Z. Right. But can I ask you a question about that? Uh So why is it your responsibility to tell her to go find somebody to love her. Why is it, I mean, did you love, did you love her? No. Okay. So then if you bring the focus back to you, right. It's not so much, I mean, this is the work that I try to do all the time is just continue to bring it back to me. Right. Like it's not so much for me to say to the other person, I think you need to do this. Believe me, I've talked people out of having relationships with me in the past because I thought it would be too much, right? Like you, this is, you should probably be with someone else, (laughs) you know, like, uh, but like, what is it? uh, What is it about me? Yeah. Like if I don't love this person, then I know it to myself to both let them go because I'm out of integrity with myself and do whatever I need to do to get right with myself. Mm. I just didn't know back then what integrity meant. The word yeah. didn't mean anything to me. Sure. I was just locked in an absolute state of fear, self-centeredness, bordering totally. on narcissism. Yeah. So, so, so the light bulb of the respect moment was, 
Lee, wake the fuck up. Like, stop tell stop. What 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 I'm very good at, Scott, is creating really compelling stories that then become my reality. And totally. then they're just bullshit. And in this one, it was basically, I fucking love you so much. I can't believe you're leaving me. And it was all based out of self-centeredness because at that time I didn't love her. Now, for right. people listening to this, you know, like if my ex-wife was to listen to this, you know, she'd probably get really upset because I said I didn't love her. For me, like love is not, I was with someone for 20 odd years, so I have to love her. I was, I love my mom because she's my mom. Love to me is connection. And, you know, for the latter part of our relationship, we were not connected. Therefore, I did not love her, right? Mm -hmm, What I should have done, the um, should have, what I know in hindsight that I wasn't brave enough to do was to just end the relationship and let her go. I, well, I kept it's scary, that. right? Because then you got well, terrifying. Your, you got to look at yourself. I mean, I relate everything you said: the self-centeredness, the selfishness, the narcissism, one hundred percent. But I didn't know any of that, so I quit drinking. I had mm. no idea how how self-referential I was, right? Um, you know, that's why they always say hindsight is twenty twenty. We we don't mm. know until we know. Yeah. There was something you said that I wanted to say something to you now, and I I I forgot. Oh well, it'll come back. Yeah, we'll come back to you. I often wonder. I often wonder to myself, like you know, like how much, how much, how much is this? I don't drink alcohol anymore. Ergo, I'm awake. And how much of this is? I'm, I've just grown up. Like I've reached 35. Nah, 35. That's the year I got sober, my friend. <laughs> Everybody fucking gets nailed at 35. That's, right? that's the year I got sober. I know what I was going to say, Lee. One of my primary addictions, one of my primary things is, you know, um, escape from reality is fantasy. So what you were just saying um, a couple of minutes ago, like I want to, escape the moment all the time. Right. So there's, I'm always looking for an out, especially because I have a mind that's a dick. Like my mind is a dick to me from the moment I wake up. Now I can do things that are healthy to try to appease it, but it wants things that like are short-term fixes. And whenever I do that, I always end up like the bigger me ends up suffering and paying the price for it. So, so much of my work is to realize that something isn't better somewhere else. And what do I need to do to get integrity, which I didn't know truly what it was either for a long time with myself in the moment. And a big part of my work has been to realize that love isn't a noun, but it's an action. Mm. If I'm not behaving in a loving way to my partner, if I'm not taking the actions of love, I'm doing a disservice to the moment that I'm in, right? Course of Miracles says, the only thing that's ever lacking in any moment is what I'm not bringing to it. Now, that's really challenging to really own that because if I feel like there's a lack of love in my relationship, and don't get me wrong, relationships do come to an end. This isn't about something going on forever. But if I feel like, like my partner's not bringing me, like my partner's not being fun or playful and I'm getting angry because of that, then it's my responsibility to look to myself and say, am I bringing play? Am I bringing the thing that I want, right? Mm. And it's, it's challenging because that means we come up against all of our own childhood woundings of what we didn't get that we needed and have to take responsibility for them. I mean, this is a, it's a quick, I mean, a, it's a huge process. I'm going to explain it really quickly, right? Because mm. we have to take responsibility for the childhood wound, be able to see that the person in front of us isn't the person that did it. So we have to simultaneously be aware of what happened to us while also what's happening now. And then the best of us is the ability to communicate it so we can say it out loud so something starts to change. And then we take contrary action to it, right? So for me, love is absolutely now where it used to be a noun and it used to be the romantic love and it used to be those feelings. It's so much more now. Am I behaving in a loving manner? Am I mm-hmm. being, am I taking loving action towards my partner? Yeah, love for me was. So, so much of what I learned about the world was really, it almost was as if somebody gave me the rule book of life. Like, 
like the reverse of the course of miracles. Someone gave me the opposite <laughs> of the course of miracles, and and they 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 made me read it every day in school, and I believed every <laughs> yeah. word. Yeah. Right. So so love to me was. Um, I have to love my family because they're my family. Like love is so like it was, it was it was connected to like family, and then it was connected to um, attraction and sex and and this uh, this ache in your heart when you can't have something. And it was, you know, when I look back on my thoughts around love, there's more conflict around like the fear of not the fear of not being able to speak my truth around love mm-hmm. it, it really overshadows the those experiences of love mm-hmm. uh, if that makes sense you mm-hmm. know so like like even now when i tell someone i love them and i haven't known them long i still feel a little bit uncomfortable saying that although i i believe it right mm-hmm. like like I, I am, I love you now is, um, you know, we, we both like in the Kaboom container, you hear that word a lot, right? Like I love you mm-hmm. and and everybody, I don't know. I don't know if everybody's okay with it, but for me, I'm kind of like, there's still that little, little boy. I call him Ching from back in the day. That's like, you can't say that Lee. You, yeah. There's a part of you that shuts down. I want to understand this. There's a part of you that tells the little boy it's not okay to say I love you, or there's a part of you that's protecting the little boy from what he thinks of love? There's a part of me protect, if we expand that, there's a part of me protecting the little boy. This is, this is what I'm learning through my work, and it's ongoing, is... Yeah. I must have been a very sensitive young boy whose sensitivity was switched off by my surroundings, but it piqued a curiosity. So I questioned everything and I wouldn't accept everything. So like when you've got a parent or when you've got a boss or when you've got a, um, a teacher and now a wife, like I fight back. It's almost like I've uh, trained myself to fight back against people trying to tell me what to do and how to think and how to behave and love sure. is in that. So like, I, I want to be able to say, um, I don't love my mom right now. And I, and, and I, and I, I don't feel like I can do that because I, yeah. No, I understand. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've, I've learned is that as children, if we were raised in what would have been a healthy, supportive environment, it would have been okay to love and hate our parents because you get to express both. That's what's real and it's okay. And sometimes how can you love the person and not hate them once in a while? But I don't know what your upbringing was like, but mine, it definitely, that was not, there wasn't space for that. I did, but there wasn't space for it. So when someone says like, so my mom was incredibly loving. Yeah. Like she was home cooked meals and, and taking me to the bookstore and I can always get a book and educational games and super loving. Right. But she couldn't handle her own uh, emotional life. So she was also a screamer and incredibly uh, uh, emasculating uh, and, and lots of things. Right. And so when I, someone says they love me, I'm terrified because I think what that means then is you're going to be really, really warm and kind to me. And you're also going to beat the shit out of me, at least emotionally, not physically. Right. Right. Hmm. So when my girlfriend the other day told me, she's like, I love you. I said, can you tell me what you mean by that? What that means to you today? And then hmm. she said, you know, God, God love her. I am so blessed to be in the relationship I'm in, Lee. I am so fucking blessed. But it's also a testament to all the work that I've done. Mm. Um, but I said to her, I said, what does that mean today? And she said, I never want to make you feel small. I only want to support you stepping into how big you can be in the world. Like, and I was like, and all of a sudden, all of my idea of love, which is layered with all this bullshit from the past, right, is now clearly defined by someone in the present moment. And mm. I think so much of the work that we're really doing and what we're meant to do while we're here is to break down all of the things that get in the way of us being here now, being in the present moment. 
and letting go of the old stories or living with the old stories, but realizing they're old stories and they cloud our ability to perceive the truth of the moment. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And some, and another moment came out of that when you talked about love. Let me make sure that I don't lose this now. Uh, am I going to lose it? I'm going to lose it. Give me a minute. While you're thinking, I'll just say, by the way, I never in the past would have had the ability to ask her what she meant by love because it would have scared me to ask for that. Right. I, I should just accept the love I'm being given as opposed to understand what it means to the other person. Because this is the thing, like we're limited by language, right? We can only communicate with words, but words might mean very different things to me than they do to you, right? I say sunrise, you might picture one thing, I might picture another. Mm. I say pizza, you immediately have an idea of what you like on your pizza, right? I have a different idea. So I think we have to be able to, con- you know, the conscious partnership and the conscious work is, can I communicate my reality to you? Because that's genuine intimacy. Me sharing what is honest and true for me and you sharing what is honest and true for you, that creates the intimacy. But if you were raised in chaotic ways, it's terrifying to tell people what's true. I used to be scared just to tell you what I had for lunch or what movie I watched because it would be information you could somehow use against me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Okay, so I got it and it links Great. into what you just said. Great. So when you said... When, when your partner said, I love you, and you said, what does that mean to you today? In my world, that is an incredibly vulnerable thing to say. Because in my, my world of stories, if I say that to someone, it's confronting them. It's not accepting their love. It's confrontational. So, so for you to say that, for me, is vulnerability. And that then gets me thinking that love, the word love and how we express it from a a below the line or or an unconscious way of being is often a way to mask our vulnerability. So let's say, let's say I see my wife and this happens a lot. Let's say my wife is just under attack from Zia, my four-year-old. Like Zia is shouting and screaming and kicking and spitting and calling and everything. And I watch this woman just get to her level and just really be present for her. Yeah. In that moment, I feel so much love for her. Um, and, and then maybe she, she looks around and, and the way her hair drops, I just see this beauty. Her, her lips are puckered up or whatever. And, I, and I'm just feeling all this love for her, right? But I don't know how to express it because I'm not, I don't have the ability to be vulnerable enough to express it. So I just turn around and go, I love you. Right? right. So now I'm using a word. I love you. Right. And, 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 and then, and then you get to the end of your relationship or whatever, and it starts getting fractured and your wife, and your wife says, you never, you never uh, acknowledge me. You never see me, never hear me. You never validate me. You never appreciate me. You're like, what the fuck? I'm telling you, I love you all the time. It's like, what the fuck does that mean? And if you think about it, what does it fucking mean? Because you're not expressing really what truly what it, what it means. Right. So let me ask you a question. So in that moment, so part of the way that I found my way through all of this, this is such a this is such a great, great thing to talk about too, because I, I I totally relate to you. And I used to think asking questions was confrontational because as a kid, it wasn't safe to ask questions. Yeah. I was either going to be shut down or I was going to be annihilated, right? So I'm either going to be dropped or I'm going to be just blasted. <laughs> so it took me a long time to understand that asking a question is actually going to give me more information about the person that I am with. And the scary part is actually being willing to get that information, right? Because if I ask a question and you have a shitty reaction to it, I'm going to learn something about you that maybe is going to have to challenge how I relate to you. And as children, we have to take whatever we're given and adjust and adjust and readjust, right? But as adults, we get to have a new experience. And for me, it began with the ability to ask questions. And like, so when you were just describing the thing about seeing your um, wife with your child and feeling love, right? But but for you, it was a whole big thing that, that you're saying like all these things were going on, but you didn't know how to express them. So you just turned and said, I love you, right? So my beginning of changing that, that was 
turning to the person and saying, I don't know how to say all the things that are going on right now, or I don't know how to express this because I was always thinking I had to know before I spoke. Mm -hmm. I had to know what I was going to say before I said it. And so my whole way in was admitting there's something I want to say, but I don't know how to say it. Or there's something I want to ask, but I'm scared to ask it. And like just that little bit created so much change in my life because I stopped behaving as the scared child. And Mm -hmm. I started to take care of that scared child within me. And it became a much healthier reparenting for myself. My, uh, my child came out this morning and, Ah. uh, and it's, it's, uh, yeah. So I am interested. I know you've been doing a lot of work on what it means to be a conscious man and I'm, I'm really, you know, doing the same thing. And I, um, I have a lot of uh, patience and forgiveness and, and, um, latitude with myself for these things, but they can still, they Thank still God, bother me. You. They still bother me a little bit. Um, Dude, they still bother me too, but think about like, I had no ability to be compassionate to myself. I could be nice to you. Yeah. I could be kind to you and I could let you off the hook, but I could not let myself off the hook for anything. I mean, the yeah. tiniest mistake and I was crucifying myself, you know, I just, I was so cruel to myself, Lee. And now what I'm noticing is my mind is cruel. I just saw my Ayurvedic doctor before I saw you today and we were having this conversation. Like my mind is cruel. I have a cruel mind, but the ability for me to recognize that my mind is cruel immediately already means that I'm not identifying as my mind. And there's something incredibly powerful in that. Yes. Because that's where there's space for something to change. Mm right? Because I'm recognizing my mind is cruel. I'm not my mind. Think about that. Like before I was just, I was the cruel thought. You were cruel. Or, or I was giving, or I was, I was a part that was giving authority to the part that was being cruel. So I'd hear the voice say, you suck. You're not doing well. You need to do more. And I'd go, oh yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. (laughs) I'm a terrible human. And like, now I go, fuck, it's that fucking thing again. And some days it's just, it's just like a woodpecker in a fucking tree that just won't stop, right? Mm. And those are the days I have to be the most kind and the most compassionate with myself. And look, Lee, you and I are walking a path that a lot of people don't walk. It's much easier to take a fucking drink and quiet the fucking voices. Mm. Or shout or rage or... Yeah, oh, totally, right? I, I mean, mean, I mean, the, the easy way out, like, so for example, this morning, it was very... very it's a, this is a, like a typical fight for me and where I am at the moment in, in, in my development is like, I look after Zia from like half past eight to half past 10 in the morning. Right. I guess mm. my time to kind of look after her and uh, Eliza, my wife, she, you know, she, she has a very particular way that she wants Zia to be raised. Like it's very mindful, very conscious led. She, she doesn't want to like nothing about that. The, there is this play time, but she doesn't want to, to just be playing all the time. She's at home during the pandemic. We need to get some kind of structure in. Whereas I'm kind of more like, yeah, okay, whatever. Right. You know, like I see there's a structure. I agree to it. I buy into it. I agree with the same thing, but you have to accept that on some days we're going to wake up a little bit later on yeah. some days. She's going to eat a little bit longer yeah. on some days. I'm going to have to take an important phone call You know, things like that happen. Right, life. Um, but yeah, but I I have this story, which obviously comes from childhood, and we, we touched upon it earlier on, of being controlled, right? So, yes. and, and, it, and I think what happens like when Liza comes downstairs or something and she says, um, why don't you get a book out for her to do some language work? Um, there's a lot of distraction around here. Like, I don't hear that. I hear, oi, chump, you're not doing a good fucking job pull your finger out your ass. So then that activates my shame. And this is what I'm working on at the moment, Scott, is in that moment, in that moment, I'm finding it really difficult to go, triggered. Right. Take a breath, right? Pause. Don't respond. Don't respond. Don't yeah. respond. I'm, I'm struggling with that. What's happening is my child is, is getting strong and he's just, why do you, and this is, this is reaction. Why do you keep trying to control me? which leads to a reaction, what the fuck? I only asked you to get a book out, which leads to, no, you fucking didn't. What did you really mean? Boom, fucking nuclear warhead goes escalated, right? 
Yeah. Now I can mm-hmm. I can fix it afterwards. I'm good afterwards yeah. at then at like calming down and saying, okay, let's how can I take 100 percent responsibility for this? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and then and then and then once I've done that, I can I can sit down um when I'm um more calm to have that conversation. But still in the moment, I'm still, it's that breath. It's that, okay, right. it's recognizing it's the, the trigger. It's the pause. Moment. It's the ability to pause, right? Yeah. It, it, I mean, it, you know, pause when agitated um, and not just react. And that's, but that's the whole key, right? I mean, that's what meditation is all about. When we sit and meditate, it's to so. notice all the things inside that trigger us, that all the little ways in which we can get hooked ourselves by ourselves, right? Mm. But I have the same thing. I mean, like, I I came out of the bathroom today and Anne was about to go take a shower and I had <laughs> I had done a number two. You'd done and, your thing. Yeah, and I and she's like, and she's like, whoo. And she said something about like, um, is the window open? Which made me think, because it wasn't, I'm bad, I'm wrong, I didn't open the window, I'm a terrible partner, I'm a terrible person, right? Well, really, she's just asking if the window's open. So the, <laughs> yeah, the yeah, smell yeah. in the bathroom goes away so she can take a shower, right? So my work is exactly the same thing, Lee. It's slowing down enough to go. And what I do is I slow down and I feel it because I have the same thing. I feel controlled and I want to fucking push back. I want to attack, right? Um, uh, the rage response comes up when you feel like you're being killed off. Mm. And I often feel like the tiniest little thing is uh, a recreation of being killed off. But that's not actually what's happening. I'm not in my mother's house anymore. I'm not a child anymore, right? So in that moment, I noticed the childhood response. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I got to fucking push back. I got to save myself. This can't happen again. And then I go, I take a breath and I say, it's not. Would you like me to open the window? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then she says, that would be lovely. And The problem is, is if you walk through life perceiving everything as a veiled threat and everything is a field of landmines that you don't know when you're going to step on, it takes so much work and slowing down and being kind and compassionate to oneself to begin to change that so that I can be aware this feels like a landmine. Wait. No, that's Anne. That's not my mom. That's not my sister. That's not whomever, right? Mm. That's the woman who loves me, who told me the other day, she doesn't want anything but for me to be big and she never wants to make me feel small. (laughs) That's the person who's saying this. And that's why I think it's so important to communicate Mm. the challenging moments because that's what starts to rewire the brain, right? Yeah. I mean, on that, I... I mean, I'm I'm gonna have a whole conversation with Liza later on today about everything that's gone on. But yeah. what happened today quite clearly is this is this is my cut, right? Yeah. And this is my this is my levels of self-esteem, self-love, self-worth. And over the last three weeks, it's dwindled. Yeah. Right. So 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 now when I'm dealing with the why don't you get a book out, uh, there's there's a lot of distraction around here. Because I haven't, because I haven't got enough of my my own self worth, my self love, it activates shame very easily. But if I if I if I've done the meditation, I've done the mindfulness, I'm in in more control, I've got more self love. Then, when she says that, I am more likely to be able to pause because I've got my cup full, right? So sure. so it's kind of like um, an acknowledgement of hey, you know, like you know, just be aware that like this morning, like wasn't a regression to like the bad times of when I used to just be an anger fuck. It was literally, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling a bit right now and I'm very, I'm very raw and very sensitive. And, and, and it's you not able to commu- were you able to communicate that? Um, no, I will. I, I, I've done, she went out with, with Zia. So yeah. I've, I've done my own yeah. self-reflection. Here's my view on it is when you, when you describe the window thing as a man, yeah. As a man, I mean, this yeah. comes from the book. It's just over there, how to improve your marriage without talking about it, right? Yeah. They say there's a woman and a man researcher, and they say this is what they say is women's fear activates her anxiety, which activates a man's shame. Mm. So when you leave the window closed and your partner says, Did you open the window? I can empathize with you with the thought of, wow, she thinks I'm so insensitive because I didn't open the window when I was having a shit. 
that is shameful because I don't want to be an insensitive guy. I want to be a conscious guy. Now, I can empathize with that because I'm a guy, right? What this book is saying is a woman will find it incredibly difficult to empathize with that shame. They'll be like, what the fuck are you complaining about? I just asked you to, if you'd open the window. What are you complaining about? I just asked you about a book. So I, what, I, what, they're, saying, what yeah. they're saying is, and this is the same for anxiety, we will never understand their need for security and fear because we don't feel as afraid, right? So they say it's all about compassion. We, we, need, to, we need to look at the guy if you're a woman right? So I'm just going to do the woman guy thing. If you're a woman listening to this and you've got a guy freaking the fuck out over nothing and you're like, I don't understand why you're behaving like this. What the guy needs in that moment is deep compassion. You need to look at him and view him, not as you, as a part of you, as a be, as a, like an enmeshment of blob of humanness that is a relationship. Recognize him as being separate from you, who has desires that are different than you, has vulnerabilities that are different than you, that has strengths and weaknesses, um, that has capacity to handle shame, fear, and anxiety completely differently than you. And then look at this guy and see this guy is cre- clearly really struggling. And really, like this, this little thing I've said to him, it just rocked his brain. Why? He must be really struggling. And if you can have compassion with a human being in that in that respect, then the guy is less likely to react because what he's dealing with is compassion. But that's the challenge because what happens is once your, once your um, shame is triggered and you say something like, what the, f- what the fuck? Like, um, are you trying to, why are you trying to control me? Then that makes them feel more anxious. So it's all about my journey, you know, my, my realization from this morning is like if I could have done things better this morning was to have more compassion was to, in that moment, to be able to say, wow, uh, Liza's pretty anxious here about Zia and getting and, and, and making sure that Zia gets her lot. And I need to be aware that she operates in a very different way than me. And this is, this is an aspect of her being that I accept as her. <laughs> I don't want to change that in her. That is who she is. And I now need to act accordingly. And all this happens in a fucking fraction of a second. It's challenging, right? I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, it is challenging, 100%. I think it all comes back to each person's individual responsibility. I think that the second that we make someone else responsible for something going on with us, we're fucked. 100%. I agree. Yeah, I agree with so, that. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of like David Data's and John Wineland's work and the masculine feminine. And, and like everyone is a balance of masculine feminine. And so, I have to do the work as the masculine partner in my relationship to be the consciousness. And the consciousness is the thing that can hold space for whatever happens. So I have to make sure that I am creating, I am doing my work every day so that my cup is full. So I don't get triggered and I don't react that same way. Or when I do, I can recover from it more quickly. I can communicate through it. I can do that. Right Mm -hmm. now. If I'm waiting for the other person, again, this goes back to the thing that I was saying about the lesson in Course in Miracles. If I'm waiting for the other person to give me something to make it better, I'm already off. I'm already off my game. I am personally responsible for myself. That's it. Now I want a partner who is going to be able to communicate. Yeah. It is going to appreciate if something is challenging, but they won't know if it's challenging if I can't communicate it. And I don't want anyone in a relationship with me to have to mind read, just like I don't want to have to mind read because so much of my childhood was based on that of navigating the minefield, right? Mm. So it's so about clear communication. It's so about clear communication. But both people have to take full responsibility for their own stuff, which means they have to do the work to know what their stuff is. Because if not, we're just perpetually in a relationship with someone that's not the person in front of us. Can I make a, an observation on that? Yeah, so, okay, this this one's a fucking nightmare. So, a vast number of people that I work with and have worked with through their addictions to alcohol are in relationships with people who have no fucking clue. Like they are so unconscious when it comes to their um, how they show up in a relationship 
how they see the other person, how they respect the other person. They're not even on, they're not even thinking about it. So they're never you're going to about do their the par- work. You're talking about the partner of the person? Yeah, you're- the partner of the person. Well, of course, so- because look at the person you're working with. You, we, right. we have water attracts at the same level. So of course they're with a par- partner that's unconscious. They're blotting out their consciousness by drinking all the time. So of course mm-hmm. they're going to be with someone like that because that's where they are, which is why I think so much of this work is a, a, a level of, it all comes back to me. It all comes back to me. It's not my focus on my partner. It all comes yeah, back yeah. to what am I doing? Where am I being? Because water attracts the same level, right? Mm. So if I'm if I'm with a partner that is really unkind, I guarantee there's I, I'm I'm doing something in that too. I gar- because I'm a part of that equation. So if I'm with someone and I'm focusing on their unconsciousness, that's not going to be helpful. I have to focus on where am I being unconscious? Where am I out of alignment? Anytime I start to look at that other person and I am saying, it's something with you, it's something you're doing, I've already lost the game. Game over. Game mm-hmm. over. There's mm-hmm. no getting out of that unless I can keep bringing it back to me and what my responsibility is. That's it. It all comes back to me and the individual, which is why this work is so personal and so individual about balancing that within. Because if not, all we're doing is blaming the other person and wanting something from the other person and never getting what we actually need or getting it sometimes and being resentful the rest of the time. And, and, and it's a horrible way to live. And it's, it'll never be enough. It'll never satisfy that thing within, that God-sized whole, right? Because mm-hmm. you actually have to have a relationship with the whole, not the thing you're trying to fill it with. It reminds me of the therapy work I did with David Burns. So I went on David Burns' Feeling Good podcast, yeah, and we we did a three hour therapy session. So it's still there. Uh, it's still there. The three episodes are on his podcast, and it was about me and Liza getting into a fight over me um, raising my voice to Zia, right? Yeah. And the bit that I want to share here that I I think is probably one of the biggest reasons why people don't do this work, right? And that they they, they just accept that it's going to be un, an unconscious relationship is when they were trying to, when I realized that the, the issue was me and the issue was my anger mm-hmm. and my connection with anger and the masculinity mm-hmm. and that if I stopped shouting, I would emasculate myself and mm-hmm. I would be more feminine um, when they said to me, are you willing to give that up? Mm-hmm. And they knew, like most people listening were like, well, of course he's going to give it up. Cause like, he's going to no, lose his relationship. You want to quit that. Yeah. I was like, I was like, no fucking way. The whole way of getting through the world. Yeah. And I said to, I said to him afterwards, like, this is a while later after we'd done the work, I, I yeah. sent him a message. I said, David, why is this so hard? Why, like this morning, for example, I just want her to see and change. And why is this so hard? And David said, dude, if you want to have a conscious relationship, it's a lonely road. You have to kill your ego. That is a lonely road. Your biggest issue here will be killing your own fucking ego and getting out of your way. By by having those thoughts of she must change. She must recognize me. She must understand me and go, okay, I'm going to slow the fuck down. What do you need to do to change right now? How could you, how can you ignore all of these thoughts and just own everything that went on this morning, right? That's, that's the fucking biggest battle, I think. Well, that's the thing. I mean, until we're willing to absolutely, and, and taking 100% or radical responsibility is really easy to say, but to actually do means you stop saying you. You stop saying you do this, you do that. And you say, I, I mm. feel scared right now. I don't feel safe. I'm mad. I know it's stupid and it, you, all you did was ask for this thing, but I feel so angry right now. And then you get to see how your partner is with that, right? Like I've done so much work, Lee, to finally be in a relationship. Like I, like I listen to all the Pat Allen stuff. So I got really clear on the masculine feminine in terms of like, did I want to be the person who had their ideas respected or did I want my feelings cherished? Right? Like, no, I want my ideas respected. So I knew, and I learned that I wanted a feminine partner. Like there's so much work that had to be done on my end to know the point of view in which I was looking out of the, 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 I had to align my inner compass. So I knew what direction I was going, because if not, all I'm doing is bouncing from partner to partner and being completely dissatisfied because I'm not being clear about what I need or what I want. 
But that process of finding out what you need or want, I totally agree with what uh, David said, it is so painful and so lonely mm. because mm. you have to grieve all the things you didn't get. Yeah. D- yeah, and yeah. It takes time. And, and often the person you're in, like in my relationship, when I'm struggling, I go to my wife. So yeah. when I'm struggling about my wife, I want to go to her and I but I but I know I have to take this shit on myself. But um I, I I just think that you know for people listening to this, like I, I really do believe that you know conflict is just a part of it's just part of part and parcel of being in a relationship and um learning how to best navigate it as as well as you can and never giving up and understanding that it is really challenging and really difficult and taking 100% responsibility. It's just, it's part of the deal, but you've got to wake up and see that and recognize that before it's too late. You know, I agree with you. One of the, one of the lessons that I learned a couple of years ago that was really helpful was remembering that you're on the same team, that it's not me pitted against the person, but we're on the same team. And if, if you and I are on the same team, right? If you and I, Lee, are on the same team, I'm going to treat you very differently than if I think that we're on opposing teams mm. or that you've come in, right? We're on the same team. We're working towards a common goal. So if we're off base, what do we need to do? And this is the masculine partner's sort of responsibility of, of leading or guiding, right? Creating that space so that, hey, we do need to check in. Hey, we do need to make this time. Hey, I do need to do this. So I'm not waiting for mommy to come do whatever, right? Because it's not, I'm not a kid anymore. Mm. I'm 46 years old. You know, it's like, this is, this is life. So I have to take full responsibility. But again, it's, it's not, it, and, and, and for me, it was so about the embodiment work because I have to be willing to sit with the pain and the discomfort that I had been running from. I have to be willing to sit with all the things that I want to lash out or attack about to get a deeper relationship within. And it's only once I've cultivated that deeper relationship within that I can then have a deeper relationship with my partner. How can I possibly have anything with another human being that I don't have with myself? I can't. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's so much work. It sounds like for anybody that's listening, like it's not reading a book. I mean, it might start with reading a book and getting an insight, but it's so personal. And it's so about sitting with and creating space for that child within that's screaming, that's crying, that needs your attention, as opposed to trying to get it from someone else. Right. And that's, that's fucking painful and it's Mm. hard and you got to be willing to trudge through the tears and the screams and the things and really be with your own pain because that's really what it comes down to you the way how much the way pain that, you actually be with the way that i look at it is i i i'm kind of um i'm kind of accepting now that liza's anxiety is going to trigger my shame and my shame is going to trigger liza's anxiety so that's like that's there for me now. I'm kind of like super present for that. The way the way I see, so that's going to happen, right? And our ability or inability to deal with that is going to lead to less or more conflict. So the way I like to look at it is, you know, take today, me and Liza have had a row. And at some point today, we're going to have to repair yeah, that. I love route, that, a row. Right? A <laughs> row. We're going to have to repair that row tonight or tomorrow. If I get my way, it'll be tonight because I don't like these things kind of like yeah, bleeding, bleeding out. Um, but here's the thing. If I'm not if I'm not conscious a certain percentage of the time, and I'm not I'm not in a way getting brownie points by doing the things I need to do as a man in order to make my wife feel loved, seen, heard, valued. If I'm not doing those things, then when it comes to the row, the stores of um, compassion that she's able to give me, or the amount of space and time that she's willing to give me. It's it's going to it's going to depend on how resilient your relationship is, right? So for me, the more that I'm giving her a massage every now and then, the more that I'm holding space for her when she's really sad, the more that I'm spending time playing with her and Zia, the more that I'm I'm doing the things that I know light her up. Then when I yeah. fuck up, when yeah. I fuck up like yeah. I did today, she's going to be like, okay, here's a guy who fucked up. 
Yeah. But it's, but it's not the end of the world. But it's not the end of the world, right? Right. 100%. But if I'm unconscious, if I'm just like sitting on a set E and fucking drinking my beer and I'm behaving in the same way time, time again, and all of a sudden I just wake up and go, I need forgiveness. I ain't going to be there, pal. Well, because you have, yeah. Well, because look at, what did you put into the bank? <laughs> right? Like, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. that's why I say love. That's why I say love is action, right? Yeah. But yeah. that consciousness too, I think you have to have a practice for it. The idea mm -hmm. of just expecting to show up and be conscious if you're not cultivating space to grow your consciousness isn't just going to happen. Talk about that. And let's talk, let's talk about what we both do to cultivate that practice because that might help some people. So for me, it's making sure that I have time in nature. It's making sure that I have time uh, meditating, writing, uh, doing yoga or qigong, energy practices, uh, definitely connecting with other men. When you were saying uh, you want to go to, to Liza, like you're mm. upset, you want to go to Liza, like for me, it's become unbelievably important that I have men to go to, to take my stuff to. So I'm not taking it all to my woman because it's just too much. It's too much to put on the relationship. Um, mm. um, you know, it, there's a, there's a whole, a whole host of, of different tools, right? Like of things that I can do to, you know, it's contrary action when I, if I, if I'm sitting here and I'm uncomfortable and I want to go check out porn, what can I just be with that feeling? Can I close the computer and walk away and take a walk around the block? Like it's the ability to self-regulate. It's the ability to reparent myself that, that really creates that change and literally talking about consciousness, right? It's breath work, it's meditation, it's sitting and being with all of the things that arise. So if we talk about the masculine feminine, the masculine being the stillness and the consciousness that witnesses all the movement and everything that is the feminine, then I have to be willing to sit with myself in a way that I'm cultivating that stillness and that deeper presence to be able to hold more of all of the wild feminine that life is. Yeah. And that my partner is. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll add to that the things that I do as well. And then people love a yeah. nice smokers board. Yeah, yeah. So um, intention is, is one for me. So intention setting, like I had a meditation before we jumped on here and I had an intention that we were going to connect and pr produce some quality for people. Um, intention is set there, you know, um, grace and prayer at meals time and connectedness as a family uh, every two hours my my alarm goes off and i i get myself centered and i ask myself if i approve of myself if i feel secure i'm in control and how am i feeling and um, so that's part of it meditation for sure um exercise i have to keep myself physically fit what i yeah. put in my mouth and what i eat and drink is really important to yeah. me oh um, just little things like making sure i've had enough water right like things like that those little mm, things. sleep yeah. Sleep. Um, reading and education is really important to me. So, but not just reading and educating myself, but putting those things into practice. Um, particularly like, you know, coaching programs like um, Kaboom, the leap that we've done, you know, like really important for my, my growth and my yeah. self-development. Um, what else would I say that is leading to me to be um, definitely processing self-introspection the work that we do creating content to help people really helps. Yeah. Like I had a fight this morning and I wrote five, I think social media posts related yeah, to I that. Re fight. I read that. Yeah. Read yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and then as I was doing, I was thinking this is going to really help people, but it's also going to help myself. Um, it's gonna help on, what, you. on what you said, the things that I need to work with, I need more men in my life for sure. Um, I've got them, but I just keep them at a distance. Breath work. I think breath work is a major one. So like I will cut out time to meditate, but I don't cut out time at breath work. So I'm going to do that. And uh, visualization is another one that I have not done a good job of incorporating. Like what do, what as a partnership, because we're talking about relationships, what is it that me and Liza want? Are we on the same page? What does that look like? You know, are we both visualizing and manifesting the same thing? Are we not? Like this morning was a clear indication because that our energy is out of alignment with who we want to be because we had a fight. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And and that is around parenting. So there's an issue there around parenting that we need to we need to get on the right page, right? Mm. So so yeah, I hope if you're listening, that kind of helps. Um, I think too, you know, just to to piggyback on what you're saying because I love everything that you're saying and I agree with you. Um, again, it all comes back to my relationship with myself first. Yeah, I can't yeah. expect to have a better relationship with my partner than I have with myself. And if I haven't learned to truly practice and do the work that it takes to be compassionate with myself, to, to really um, love those parts of myself that are wounded and hurt and really offer them healing, then I can't, I can't offer anything else to my partner. Like our relationship with another person mirrors our relationship to ourselves 100%. Oh yeah. Oh 100%. yeah. Definitely. It's let make sure you've what is it? The press and smiles always says, make sure your cup is overflowing and you give to other people from the overflow. Um, the overflow yeah. Scott Wilkson Nelson, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Folks, if you want to work with this amazing guy, and I really strongly suggest that you do after listening to what we just talked about, get over to www.1000daysober.com, click on the podcast page. You'll see a little section just for Scott. You'll see the show notes and all that kind of stuff and all the links to get hold of this wonderful man to have a, a good conversation for him. Thank you very much, Scott. Hey, it's been awesome. Thank you so much for having me, man. And it was it's such a great conversation. And I think, you know, just this alone, like this is men talking about these things is mm. so healing and so important. And I think, you know, healing that toxic masculinity that each one of us has been raised with and, and that is that we've we've gone through is just so important and i think it starts with conversations like these so thank you for oh yeah definitely a state of flow didn't that feel like yeah. five minutes yeah that, I, <laughs> I could i could talk to you for another hour no problem yeah yeah, yeah. crazy yeah. All right thank you scott just another reminder folks that if you want to work with lee davy that's me and the rest of the 1000 days sober coaching team then get over to www.1000daysober.com and book yourself a choose yourself call with me or a member of the 1000 days sober team so we can see if you're a good fit to take the strive method for addictions course the strive method for relationships course or just join the strive support team and if you're feeling in a really, really serving mood, please rank and rate our podcast at whatever podcast platform you do or spread the word around social media and tell people to come and listen to us. Thank you very much. Love you all. Bye. <laughs>